You know, a lot of people will tell you that the single most challenging thing in all of sports to do is to hit a baseball consistently well, and they have a good point. You think about it, a guy standing 60 feet, six inches from you, maybe throwing 95 miles an hour, mixing in the occasional knee-bending curve, and there you are, with a round bat, trying to line up this speeding round object, fractions of a second to make a judgment about it, and then launch your swing. Well, we're trying to launch a project of our own here in New York, and in its own way, it's a giant challenge, too. We're trying to put together the New York Sports Museum and Hall of Fame to memorialize the history and the people who have made New York, in many ways, the sports capital of the United States. And here to help us talk about it is the highly respected columnist from the New York Times Pulitzer Prize winner, Dave Anderson. Dave, if this gets off the ground and if it's successful, what would that mean to us? Well, Bob, for years now we've had great sports landmarks in this area. Yankee Stadium, Madison Square Garden, Shea Stadium, Giant Stadium over New Jersey, Nassau Coliseum. But this would be a collective sports landmark where people who are interested in whatever sport can come and see the memorabilia, the artifacts of what has made sports such a great part of our culture for a century in this area. The founder is Bill Shannon, who's a working sports writer in New York, uh, official scorer at Met Games and Yankee Games, and the electors, better than 250 of them, would essentially be veteran media people from the New York City area who've covered sports a long time, who are uh, experts in the field, and they would make their considered judgments. So this wouldn't be a popularity contest or necessarily go to the biggest names. To be selected, uh, to be enshrined in this Hall of Fame would be a prestige honor. It would also be a controversial honor, which is great. That's what sports, to a great extent, is all about. As easy as some people will be to be to elect to this Hall of Fame, there will always be some that should that some people think should be in it, and that's really part of the fun of, of any Hall of Fame. Well, let's not talk about those uh, who would generate debate. Let's talk about those who'd be in there by acclamation. I would think Sugar Ray Robinson certainly would be in there. I'd like to see his pink uh, Cadillac in in the Hall of Fame. Uh, I'd like to see touches of the person in the Hall of Fame. Uh, Sugar Ray Robinson, Joe Namath, Babe Ruth, uh, Mickey Mantle, Jackie Robinson. Willie Mays. Willie Mays. You know, we could go on forever. Yeah, and the criteria loosely would be that you would have to have performed for the significant portion of your career for a New York City team or have achieved great glory in a New York area venue. Absolutely. Boxing at Madison Square Garden, tennis at Forest Hills, the Nicholas Golf Championships. We forgot the, the, the great players on the Knicks that won the championships years ago, the great players on the Islanders when they won their four Stanley Cups. Clearly, sports has long since become big business, a multifaceted business at that. So what better way to address the enormous task of building and operating this museum than to examine some of the problems we face trying to get it done with two of New York's better known business leaders, Lou Rudin, the chairman of the Association for a Better New York and president of Rudin Management Corporation. And Lou has been a driving force behind the New York City Marathon and the Tennis Center at Flushing Meadows. And Bill Gladstone is also here, co-chief executive of Ernst & Young, one of the world's leading public accounting and consulting organizations, and not incidentally, the owner of what I'm told is the largest collection of Dodger memorabilia anywhere in the free world. So, Lou, the first question to you. What role does sports play in the life of a community, in a business community specifically? Well, I think a very important role. Uh, the morale of this community, or any community in this country, uh, focuses in on, uh, in many ways, on the sports events and the sports teams. And I think the point, Lou, that you made about morale is important. When you've got the teams and when things are going great, you kind of take it for granted. If you go back to the days when the Dodgers and the Giants left the city and you know what it did to the morale of the city, yeah. it just points up so graphically how important sports are to the life in any city, as, even a city as big as New York. Yeah. What does it mean in, in financial terms? Just an example was, uh, was our New York City Marathon, which, uh, which was a local kind of uh, in Central Park event, which we took out of Central Park in 1976, made it a five borough event, one year only had 2,200 runners. Now it has 25,000 runners. Uh, there's 9,000 that come from foreign lands. Uh, and the economy is, is the, is the benefact, beneficiary of that. There's millions, 50, 40, 50, 60 million dollars mm -hmm. that comes directly into the treasury. God knows what goes to the hotels and to the restaurants and, and others. Well, in financial terms, I think the revenues that are brought in from teams playing here 
And as Lou said, in the hotel business and the restaurant business, uh, I think the whole television industry and the focus on New York uh, is just tremendously important. An important aspect of the museum is this. It won't just celebrate sports heroes or specific events. It'll be kind of a trip through the sociology uh, of New York. You had to take a streetcar to go to a Dodger exactly. game in 1920 or, or whatever. Uh, Jackie Robinson breaking into the major leagues with the Brooklyn Dodgers in 1947. There will be an educational byproduct that isn't confined to sports for those who make their way through this and museum. And also kids growing up in this city can relate to that very easily, I would hope. Can relate to it more easily than some of the That's things right. they might find in, in a textbook. What do, you, what do you think business leaders can do to help make, uh, make a museum like this a reality? Well, certainly the thing they have to do is support it, support it with funds because you just can't get something like this off the ground without that kind of support. They have to support it with funds. They've got to support it with their own employees and encourage them to be users of the museum. A lot of the major museums, all of them in New York, encourage corporate giving and corporate support by using the facilities. And I think the corporations of the city of New York and the major private companies are going to be the ones that really make this thing happen and make it come alive. The IBMs and, and the Ernst and & Youngs and the Pete Marker Mitchells and the, and the, and the Bristol Myers, get them to, to, to utilize a facility like that because most of the corporate leaders are sports-minded. They would be prime to, to support in both funding and the Bill said was corporate use of that facility. Makes sense. And what's single greater, I can even safely be said, the single greatest common denominator in our society is sports. Maybe not everybody likes sports, but if you, if you threw out various pursuits, I think you'd find a higher percentage of people who would identify with yeah. sports than almost any other leisure activity, anything you could think of, right? Absolutely. And the the beauty of this museum is it's not just focused on one sport. And we've got wonderful halls of fame, baseball and basketball and football and all of those. But this museum focuses on almost 30 different sports. And the people who've made sports great, some of the business leaders, some of the trainers, some of the umpires, we've got a lot of people that can be honored in it. And we have the hall of fame attached to this sports museum and a chance to recognize your heroes. I think it's wonderful to have heroes, and people, young people and old, like to give honor to those heroes. How do you think it would fit in with the national halls of fame in various sports? Well, I, I know that they hope to have an exchange situation with each of the uh, halls of fame, so that some of the great baseball memorabilia would be on display in New York, and other halls of fame from Canton, Ohio, the Pro Football, Basketball in Springfield, possibly the Hockey Hall of Fame in Toronto. It's going to make it so much easier for everyone, and it will also centralize the New York feeling, let's say, of sports. You know, everybody talks about the great culture in, in New York, art, music, ballet, whatever it may be, but to me, sports has always been part of our culture. It's another form of our culture, and there's nothing more graphic in the New York area than this museum and Hall of Fame. So we've explored this undertaking as it relates to our end of the business, the media, and we've shared some insights with Lou Rudin and Bill Gladstone regarding the business problems that lie ahead, and we thank both Lou and Bill for being with us. But now to the heartbeat of the matter. What about the people whose exploits are significant segments of the dynamic history that the museum, after all, intends to memorialize? Well, in the area of understatement, New York has certainly produced more than its share of the legends of sports history. We're fortunate today to have three of those legends with us. At the age of 24, Dave DeBuscher was already the player coach of the Detroit Pistons. The deal that brought him to the Knicks for Howard Comives and Walt Bellamy ranks as one of the greatest in New York sports history. An effective scorer, and more importantly, one of the most aggressive rebounders of his generation, DeBuscher proved to be the missing link who helped elevate a very good team to a great one. Skating for a squad that included Mike Bossy and Brian Trottier, Dennis Potvin captained the Islanders' four consecutive Stanley Cup winners in the early 80s. And at the end of the 80s, he was named by the hockey writers as the defenseman of the decade. Dennis Potvin, the captain of one of hockey's greatest dynasties. 
A genuine all-time great, Tom Seaver was the single greatest symbol of the Mets' rise from laughingstock to world champions. He won 25 games and the Cy Young Award in that miracle season of 1969. Though he'll always be associated with the Mets, he had his moments for other teams, a no-hitter for the Reds in 77, and it was while wearing a White Sox uniform late in his career that he captured career victory number 300, ironically, at Yankee Stadium. What do you think, guys, I'll throw it out to you, what do you think a Hall of Fame like this would mean in New York? Well, I feel that uh, in a city so rich in tradition for sports, has probably had more major sporting events than any city in the world. Uh, it's very apropos and I think uh, sensational that the concept is being developed and will hopefully in the near future uh, reach fruition. I think it's well deserved. Tom? In this city, how can we not have uh, a let's say one room, one place, one, one exhibition of, of all that talent and all that history uh, that can be enjoyed by people not only from New York City but those that travel through our great city as well. For athletes all around the world and spectators and people who wish to be athletes, mm -hmm. once a museum like that is set up in New York, there'll be a tremendous identity for all athletics and especially athletics in New York and the product of what we've been over the years. Time Magazine did a a uh, cover story, a special issue, a few months ago, uh, 20 years ago, 1969, and it was supposedly a, a turning point year in the history of the country, and, the, and they cited several events. Uh, at the beginning of, of the year, in January, Richard Nixon was sworn in, having won the election the year before. During the course of the year, Woodstock, which defined a certain segment of a generation. Men walked on the moon. Ted Kennedy's political career was changed by Chappaquiddick. There were two sports events mentioned in 1969. The face of pro football was changed when the Jets beat the Colts in January in Super Bowl III, and a miracle happened when the Mets won the World Series. And Time Magazine is a national publication, not confined to New York, and yet that's remembered 20 years later sure. as part of the history of the entire year alongside events like Men Walking on the Moon. The universal appeal of sports too, Bob. I remember John Condon, the late John Condon at Madison Square Garden, telling me he was once introduced to the Pope and they introduced him as John Condon of Madison Square Garden, and the Pope immediately took the pose of a boxer. <laughs> That's what he associated Madison Square Garden with, boxing. And uh, it's, you know, it's, everybody knows. I kind of envision uh, the museum to be a place that I hope to go to uh, and see 20 buses lined up along the street, and all the kids inside looking at all the different uh, old pictures or whatever is there, and hopefully out of all those kids you can touch two or three of them and maybe that'll be an inspiration for them to work harder, stay in school or whatever, to try to achieve or give them, give them something to look forward to. And that's kind of what I look at this museum to, to really be the appeal. How do you see the uh, potential involvement of corporations in a project like this? Well, we're in a, uh, a state, a city, where there are more major corporations than any other in the United States. And uh, it could be, as I mentioned, a opportunity for for the first time for corporations to become actively involved in the sponsorship and support of a museum. And uh, that, uh, I think, would make a corporation very proud and, and honored to be a part of it. And this is really an opportunity for team participation, especially in this city. And we know how, how important it, it's going to be. Uh, and the only way it's going to get off the ground, the only way it is going to work, if, it's, if we do have a team effort. I think this is certainly a museum that's going to have a real identity with New York all around the world. And the people who are sponsoring this are also going to get that same identity. I think I'd jump right in. And all of you can vouch for the fact that uh, most business leaders, most corporate people, have an affinity for sports, don't they? People in business have a competitive uh, feeling about what they do. And that's really what brings sports people and athletes together, is a competitive uh, feeling. Plus, Plus also some people worry about certain businesses leaving New York. The New York Sports Museum and Hall of Fame can't possibly leave New York. Oh. And so this very important project can provide enormous benefit to this and future generations of New York's children, and it can add one more must-see attraction to a great city, but only if the New York business community actively and enthusiastically supports the project. It's a project without government funding, so it's up to the corporations who own the season boxes and constantly utilize sports to serve as marketing and corporate communication vehicles to step up and provide the monies necessary to accomplish the goal. This project will allow all of New York's corporations to actively involve themselves in an undertaking that will offer tangible educational benefits to all of New York's youngsters. So join our team. Join Dave DeBuscher, Dennis Potvin, Tom Siever, 
Dave Anderson and me, and help us provide our town with the most valuable institution, the New York Sports Museum and Hall of Fame. Thanks very much. <laughs>